हरे कृष्णा महात्मा प्रभु humble obeisances welcome back to the monks podcast thank you all glories to prabhupad hare krishna our podcast is one of the best received podcasts and i've been praying and hoping that we could have your association again so thank you very much for making time finally and uh, you know ever since i have been reading your articles and even hearing your talks one of the things which i have appreciated about your presentations among many is that uh it's it's scripture grounded in real life experience it's not just scripture at a lofty level of course we all want to rise to the lofty level but most of us are facing reality at a very we could say gritty down to earth level and how does scripture translate into that that uh, explaining that so in that so that is uh, in that light i thought we will discuss one topic which is often either miss explained in terms of how it is taught or it's definitely misapplied in terms of how what devotees think it means and they try to apply it in their lives so that topic is the the instruction of beat to beat the mind so bhakti sudan sutakur famously said that beat the mind morning and evening there are different variants of what he said he says beat the mind or with a broom clean it or beat it with a broom whatever but the idea of beating the mind now the the way this is often misunderstood is that or we could say misunderstood mistaught misapplied whatever is that everything that comes up in inside you that is just your whimsicality and mm-hmm. forget whatever is coming up inside you and just follow your authorities follow whatever you are mm-hmm. told okay. and that will purify you yeah Yes yes now of course in one sense we do, the, the mind does come up with a lot of stray whimsical and dangerous ideas also but yes. to use that categorically can be problematic so so in your understanding let's begin with this what what is what is the scope for saying what is the scope of this instruction beat the mind and what yeah, need so, to fall beyond the scope yeah so what i hear you saying is that it can bring us to a place where we totally lack our own intelligence we lack confidence in what we think is right we lack confidence in our we can lack confidence in our common sense in the guidance of super soul and our intuition um it's interesting that prabhupad explains intuition or the chaita guru guidance from within he said well that's what brought you to krishna consciousness so we can't deny that intuition because it's the very thing that got us here we didn't have any authorities right it was just we you know we wanted krishna and so prabhupad explains many many times how this intuition works or how the the guidance of super soul works it works in relation to the level of one sincerity dadami buddhi yogantam priti purvakam then one might say well priti purvakam is not sincerity that's love so prabhupad he explains the other side of the equation that you're not going to get perfect direction from super soul unless you you're on the path of rag you're on that level but in in many 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 letters we know when someone achieves success prabhupad would say oh krishna is guiding you because you're sincere krishna is giving you intelligence or he would say just do it krishna will give you intelligence so he he makes a distinction between like this guidance of how to practically apply krishna consciousness and and understanding like the nuances of siddhanta which which means krishna is revealing to you as he would reveal your swarup and and so on so there beautiful i think you're right? pointing out the fact there has to be a balance there is a, there is a line and a difference it's not all one or the other yeah it's beautifully put the dami buddhi yogam tam so what you are saying is that if somebody might say that unless you are purified krishna is not going to speak to you and that right. might be true at one level but krishna, krishna bhakti and krishna's voice doesn't have to be like a one zero thing that krishna also says ye tham am prapadyante that as all people surrender i yes. reciprocate so it is not that somebody with a very preliminary level of surrender will have no reciprocation from krishna yes yes so krishna may not necessarily guide somebody who is not having love towards loving him 
but krishna may guide yes. them towards a slightly higher level of understanding a slightly better choice so so in that sense intuition even a uh, even a materialistic person sometimes i hesitate to use the word materialistic because how are we going to assess even a person who is living materialistically might have some spiritual conceptions may have some yes. higher purpose to their life but just yes. from external perspective if we take that even we can't say that they are completely uh, bankrupt or disconnected from the voice of the super soul entirely you don't want to hear something interesting yes please do there was he's not a devotee he's more of a buddhist but he studies the vedas he's a teacher he has his own organization and he explained bhagavad gita in relation to karma in a way that was so brilliant i've never heard anybody explain it that way and i was thinking obviously it's coming from krishna and he's you know he's a gyani and he has a good brain and any anyone who's well well read has read many things of philosophers and writers that have have we just look at it and say how did you know that you don't even have a guru this is this is transcendental knowledge so we see that krishna's giving guidance and and prabhupad's point is he he'll, he'll give you that intelligence up to a certain point but then when you want to transcend until you're more advanced you're 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 going to obviously you need a guru but when one sincere krishna sends the guru because you're sincere so the guru within sends you to the guru without and then the guru without sends you back to the guru within that's the process hmm there's there's a purport and i was looking for it and i can't find it but prabhupad said maybe you remember this he said that the duty of the guru is to enable his disciple to be able to hear the guru from within and when his disciple can hear the guru from within the guru's business the guru can retire so to speak he's he's brought his disciple to this level where now he's guided by chaitanya guru and he doesn't need the external because he's in touch with chaitanya guru so it's a, a beautiful idea Prabhupada, our gurus are trying to get us to be able to hear this. And so, and if we're sincere, That's definitely he, he guides us. Maybe we don't speak directly, but he guides us. Yes. You know, in some ways, in material counseling circles, they say that the purpose of counseling is to make the counselor redundant. And yes, so, yes, once yes. I, like I had heard a devotee say, this is sacrilegious, this is never the mood of the guru disciple relationship but then in one sense it is that a devotee always feels spiritually dependent and grateful but a devotee over a period of time shouldn't be practically dependent on the guru you know if you yes. look at prabhupad's yeah. own example how much practical guidance did prabhupad get from his guru maharaj It's practically right. you know they just i i try to do as much research as i could there not more than a dozen interactions between him and his guru maharaj so in that sense the idea that prabhu na prabhu pad always said that i i always said, felt the presence of my spiritual master with me but uh, that was yes. more a so spiritual dependence rather than a practical dependence you know there was a letter this is very funny the devotee was taking care of tulsi this is early in the movement maybe 1972 so she wrote prabhu pad a list of questions like 20 questions 25 questions you know that we water it and put it in the sun and you know just just very basic things that you wouldn't really have to ask your spiritual master so prabhupad started answering the questions and he realized after answering for three or four or five questions this is she's asking common sense questions and so prabhupad answered the first three or four or five and then he said um regarding the rest of your questions use your common sense and if you don't have common sense ask someone who does so if um and then as you mentioned prabhupad wanted us to be independently thoughtful and if you go in prabhupad's books he uses the word common sense a lot to explain this philosophy is common sense there is a creator there is a source not everything must follow from a source everything in the creation must be in the source this is common sense 
you know, chapter Canto two about the Paramatma, realization of the Paramatma, realization that we're not the body, it's common sense. Prabhupada says, it's common sense to understand our consciousness is different than the body. So he he uses the word common sense a lot. And, and as you were talking, I was thinking, well, what would be the definition of a cult? You cause people to doubt their common sense, and then you can control them because now they think, I can't think. So I think that's the danger you're referring to of being dependent on the guru, but being dependent in an unhealthy way. So you can't be independently thoughtful. And then so the guru instructs you, like Prabhupada said, you should be a fool in front of your guru, but don't act like a fool. So, you know, it's not the, I'm a fool in front of my guru and I'm a fool when I leave. No, you've heard from him. How can you be a fool after you hear? But if we think that way, then we think, oh, I don't know anything. I can't think. Tell me what to do. That's a psychological weakness. Mm, beautifully put. Huh? So, Prabhu, you said, what is the definition of? When you said, make of, people doubt of the a cult. cult. Uh, the definition cult. of a cult, 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 cult you know, it's like, you know, if, if, um, I mean, it, it's, this, this, is a, this is a problem for younger devotees, because when a younger devotee comes, you know, you remember, maybe it's not so drastic for you from India, but when we join, it's a complete culture shift. So it's like a don't touch anything with your left hand, except when you clean yourself, you know, don't put your finger in your nose. You know, it's like, this is the, you know, you, we don't wear regular underwear, we wear this. You know, if you go in the bathroom, you have to take a bath um, after you evacuate. And, you know, we're being told all these things by our leaders. And so it's like, oh, what do I do now? Can I walk out? Is it okay? You know, it's like, we don't know what to do. So we start doubting ourselves, and we think, actually, I don't know anything. This is all new. So it, it's common to doubt ourselves. And then like you're saying, so you become very dependent on your authority, which is good, and we should be. I'm not saying we shouldn't be, but we become so dependent that we disconnect from intuition. And like you're saying, sometimes the authority may not give the best advice and you sense that this wouldn't be good for me, but you think, well, what do I know? I'm just a new devotee, he knows better. And I can't tell you how many devotees have told me they regrettably acted against their intuition for this reason, because they thought the senior knew more and I, what do I know, I'm a young devotee. And years later in hindsight, they see, I should have listened to my intu intuition. I knew this wasn't going to be good, but I did it anyway. You have that experience also? Yeah, I would say that, of course, not so much with the cultural radicalism, what you said, although even in India, it's the, some of the cultural items are not commonplace, like you, what you mm -hmm. mentioned also. So, but that's true. But the overall point that... Uh, it's uh, your whimsicality that got you into trouble. It is your independent mindedness that got into, <laughs> uh, got you into material existence in the first place. In mm -hmm. fact, I could say for more than, uh, more than, I would say 10 years in Krishna consciousness, I never heard uh, the phrase independently thoughtful that Prabhupada wanted. Uh -huh. independ uh -huh. Independence itself was seen as the cause of suffering mm, and dependence yeah. as the solution. Now, of yeah. course, I'm not uh, blaming any authority because, you know, everybody yes. has a particular way of training and many times, and I would say only on a few occasions would be the devotees guiding us, the authorities guiding us be ill-intentioned. They may also, yeah. in one sense, like I was talking in, with uh, one spiritual master in our moment, he said that the spiritual was this, this role of the guru is the most challenged and the most challenging <laughs> <laughs> so you want to hear something interesting and funny yes, one please. of the gurus i don't know i only know one maybe more one of the gurus said i don't want any of my disciples to listen to my pre you know 1992 lectures or 1989 um because he was young and he realized that he he gave so many immature, you could say, instructions on practical matters that he realized were hurtful, harmful. Uh, as a don't listen to those, I didn't understand. So uh, I find that interesting and honest. But that brings up the question, okay, so 
So what you what there is truth to what you said. We we don't we're not self-realized, so we can't always trust our mind. Our mind's devious. It tries to pull us away. But in light of that, and even if I'm a young devotee, if my intuition is strong that something is not healthy for me, and my authority is telling me you should do this, how does a devotee deal with that? Does he just go along with it, even against his intuition? Or should he stand up and say, no, this is wrong, I don't want to do this? As I said, I think many of us as Prabhupada disciples, we would admit we've, we've given wrong instructions. And so, you know, I was thinking about this question. Sorry, so if I just interrupt you. So you're saying that, yeah. I mean, I thought many of us as Prabhupada disciples would say that we received wrong instructions and we followed them because we were told like that. But it's a remarkable amount of candor to say that we gave wrong instructions. Yeah, both, both, yeah. Yeah, both are true. Um, that's just what happens when you grow up. You look back and you realize, yeah, I, I thought I knew more than I did. So, you know, a, a conversation which the conversation we're having and what you're talking about, ISKCON, which is a very authoritative movement, a hierarchy, follow your temple president, follow GBC, follow your Siksha Guru, follow your mentor, you know. That's the way Prabhupada set it up, and that's the way it works. Then the question comes, but what if I receive an instruction that I disagree with or I think is harmful for me? What? Mm. How, how to... Um, how to process that in a way, you know, no, no, I, I, it's late for me, I'm tired. This is what I always come back to. The problem is usually, or, or often, not with the devotee, but it's with the leader who shouldn't have given that instruction. If, indeed, if, if for the sake of discussion, indeed that instruction was harmful or potentially harmful, or was just wrong, misguided. And the devotee now is feeling guilt, shame, um, he's shutting himself down. He, he wants to follow, he doesn't, but he can't. But he's trying to neglect his feelings. And it's, this is a problem for him. The real problem is the leader, because the leader created that problem for the devotee. So when we have these discussions, I always think the solution is leadership has to become better and more sensitive to what's going on in the heart and mind of the devotee, what the devotee needs. And then I, I just wanted to tell a story before I forget. It's a really beautiful story. So in, I was in Los Angeles, 19, it was either 1975 or 1976. And Los Angeles was the world headquarters for the movement in the 70s. Mm. Um, at least the West, probably called it the Western world headquarters. So he would, he would spend in the 1970s, 71, 72, he spent lots of time in Los Angeles and I was there. Uh, he spent seven months there in 1970, and he spent three months when I was living there in 1972. So he would come back every year. Some temples he'd go to two or three days at Los Angeles. He'd stay at least a week, 74, 75, 76. So Los Angeles had this big, beautiful temple. It was the home of the BBT, which was the Sanskrit department, the art department, the layout department. You know, all the book publishing was there. The distribution, that was the main warehouse from where all the books after they were published went. It had the spiritual sky incense. It had the fate exhibit, which was the dioramas. They were building the dioramas. It had the golden avatar recording studio, which recorded Prabhupada's bhajans, recorded all his lectures and recorded the music of Mangalananda and maybe some others. So Prabhupada came there and he visited every department. They went one by one. Some of them he had to drive a mile or so. And one of my god brothers was there. And he told me what Prabhupada said. And every place Prabhupada went, he would say, print books for Krishna. Then he go to Spiritual Sky, make money for Krishna. The warehouse, distribute books for Krishna. The, the studio, sing for Krishna. The art department, paint for Krishna you know, the book layout, you know, do this work, you know, each department, whatever they're doing, he would say, do that for Krishna. Now, what was the message? Whatever is your nature, whatever inspires you, you do that and you'll be, you'll be well situated in Krishna consciousness. So 
you know, sometimes we feel very inspired to do something and the authority should be sensitive to that. Then you don't have this problem. Then the authority and you, it's like you're both getting guidance from super soul. It's when the authority doesn't understand or sometimes the disciple doesn't understand and the authority does. Of course, that's a problem also. But I think it, it's very common that the authority may not be sensitive, sensitive in every situation. And it causes a problem for the devotee. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. That's true. A beautiful incident about Prabhupada saying that you know, whatever a devotee is engaged in, do that for Krishna. So, it's, so Prabhupada was very broad in his approach. But in some ways, our understanding of his, of his approach may be based on maybe taking up one aspect of Prabhupada, one aspect of his instructions. Yeah. Yeah. And then yes. we may make that yes. as the absolute. Now, yeah. uh, to be inspired, in my understanding, to be inspired by one instruction is, is perfectly fine. In fact, it's wonderful because we cannot, none of us can apply all of Prabhupada's instructions. We're just too finite and Prabhupada's vision was too broad. But... It's so in one sense, it's good to be inspired by one, one instruction of Prabhupada or one dimension of Prabhupada's mission. But to expect everyone to adopt that and to insist that yeah. every, anybody who's not doing that is not following Prabhupada. That is where the problem might come up. Yeah, well, and Prabhupada was expert at engaging people. Now, you know, I mean, the confusion may come. Well, you, you know, you're a brahmachari, you just move in the temple. Your duty is to do whatever you're told. Right? That's how you get trained, basic training. And that's how you surrender. You do menial service. So that's very healthy. Then as you grow, we see, oh, there's Chaitanya Chara and he's been washing pots for three years. But you know, every moment he's not washing pots, he's reading books. Oh, we see that. He's always reading books, reading books, reading. Give him more books. He'll read them all. So then I'm your, I'm your temple president and I see that and I talk to you and say, you like teaching? You like writing? He says, yes, very much. So then I think, okay, you watch pots for, pots for three years, you pass the test. So now let's engage you. You know, you have this voracious, you have this voracious appetite to study. You can study all day, you can study all night, you can read, write, just teach, you know, nonstop. We see that. So naturally, a good leader is going to engage, engage you that way. Did, did you ever hear this story where Prabhupada said, I created these big, big projects, like building these big, big temples to engage the big, big managers. It's like, you know, voracious eaters, feed them. They're like Bhima, you know, feed them a big project. They got it. They have to manage, you know, they'll, they'll destroy the universe if they don't manage this, you know, they'll, they'll fight with one another. You know, that was, that was kind of the mood that Prabhupada honed in on. Oh, look, look at these men. They need to control. They need to manage. Okay, if we don't <laughs> engage them like that, they great problems, right? Because that's, that's their nature. But you gauge them that way, and they're managing big pro projects, and everyone appreciates it. And, and I've seen, have you ever seen this? You have a really nice devotee, really sweet, really good at so many things, and then he's given a service which is totally against his nature, and he, does it, he doesn't do it well. And then everybody doesn't like him anymore. Like, he's messing this up. We don't like him, you know? So it's, it, it's a bad choice. It's bad for everybody. Bad for him, bad for everybody. True, true. So true. That means, see, the devotee themselves feel dissatisfied because in one sense, our movement is that where a person is authority is ex expected to exude authority and certainty to, to get mm -hmm. confidence of the subordinates. The, the aspect of vulnerability that, you know, maybe I don't know what is to be done. And we have to find out that is something which is maybe I would say even then in the last 10 years ethos has been changing significantly. But uh, in the past that uh, earlier at least that authority, how do you have, uh, how do you get faith in your authority? Because the authority knows what has to be done. But then, yeah, if, if as you said, if somebody is incompatibly engaged and then they they exude certainty when they themselves are not sure because they are not that competent at it. Then that alienates everyone. It's harmful for both that devotee who's been put in that authority position and those who are subordinate also. Yeah. I, I, I don't know in India if this is true, but in America, or I would say the West in general, vulnerability is highly appreciated. And 
people trust people who are vulnerable. If, if you're willing to admit your fault, if you're willing to apologize for a mistake, rather than doubting you, they trust you because they see you're willing to acknowledge your own fault. It's appreciated. If you have a culture where, like what you're saying, if that's the culture, then you'll look at vulnerability and humility as a handicap and you won't want to exhibit it because you'll feel that you'll lose control and you lose power. But I think we can all recognize that humility and vulnerability is extremely difficult. It, it takes a very powerful person, someone free from ego, at least fairly free from false ego and the need to be recognized and honored to do it. And if you, if you, do, if you read anything in the corporate world about this, they'll ask people, what kind of leader do you like? And they'll say, the humble one is humble. I like him the most. And also that humble leader, he tends to listen better and judge less. And so people feel inspired by them. I had a god brother who came out in public to admit something that he did. He was a highly placed god brother in something that he did which was extremely embarrassing. And I was with him at the time, and I was wondering what's going to be the response. And I was surprised. It had a positive response. It's like they almost didn't pay attention to what he did because they were paying attention to this intense humility because no one in ISKCON ever admitted something in, in uh, the way he did, you know, usually admit it when you get caught. I mean, what can you say? You know, <laughs> but he came out voluntarily. He didn't get caught. He came out voluntarily to admit it. And, and so I thought, I, I want to go to the Ritvik sites and see what they say, because that's kind of the pulse of how people are going to react. And to my surprise, all the Ritvik said, well, another one fell down, but at least he was honest. It was like the first time they ever praised an Iskan guru that I ever heard, said, but at least he was honest. So even the Ritviks praised the honesty. And so when I saw that, I, I said, okay, here, this is, a, this is a lesson. Honesty and vulnerability build faith, they build trust, and trust is the basis for a relationship. And when I trust you, you trust me, that you can be vulnerable to me, I can be vulnerable to you. And that's, that's important. And then you have leaders that can't be vulnerable, then they're living, you know, kind of, if they're living with difficulty or problems, they're all, try, they're trying to not let anybody find out. It's a very difficult way to live. It's unnatural and it can, it can cause problems. And that's not the culture. That's not the, at least it's not the culture in our books. It might be the culture outside the books. But in the books, that's not our culture. Yeah, yes, there are a lot of points here. I appreciate this point about humility. Three points, actually, a lot of things you said. First is that vulnerability is associated with humility. See, what I've realized, one thing is that generally, uh, concepts, if they're not presented in familiar terminology, it often, many devotees feel uncomfortable. Are you bringing something in yeah. from from mundane uh -huh. psychology or mundane self-help yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 So we won't find the word vulnerable much in Prabhupada's books. So I feel... It's actually, it's actually saralata, simplicity. That's the way, you know, duplicity means to be two different people outside and inside and saralata, be, you know, so it just doesn't come out in that word vulnerable, but it's actually... Oh, saralata, okay. You know, simplicity as a... Okay, no, as no, opposed sorry. to duplicity. So simplicity is what you see is what you get, and duplicity is what you see is not what you get. You're seeing you're seeing something better than I am. Oh, that's my that, understanding. You know, okay, so, so I agree with you on this point. But generally, saralta is explained to mean that you should be inside the way you are acting outside, not yeah, that you should be. Yeah, what you are yeah. inside you should show outside. That the two different things. I mean, if you are talking about purity, be pure internally. That's simplicity. But uh, to explain it in this way, it makes sense. It makes eminent sense. So that's also one more way we can connect it. And then duplicity is Kutinati, what Bhakti Thakur talks about, Chetan Charitam yeah. also talks about. So this is a very yeah. good way. Three ways we can connect it. So in general, 
vulnerability is very powerful actually especially in general what happens is with respect to the spiritual master at least uh, for many devotees in iskon who have what you can call a, a big spiritual master in yes. the sense that the person has thousands of disciples the devotees yes. don't get much to interact with the spiritual master they usually get to interact with some other authority the temple president or the their counselor or whoever it is and uh, it's difficult for them to be infallible nobody is actually infallible at one level although the guru connected with krishna in principle can be at the same time so it's a uh, it's sooner or later we will f- be able to see some faults in our authorities and it's not just that we are seeing faults because we have fault finding mentality but it's because there are faults so <laughs> with all due respects though no offense intended but then at that time if this ethos of vulnerability is there it actually endears okay you are admitting it let's let's i'm not going to fixate on you now let's see how we can solve this but it's often uh, the devotees i would say that uh, it's uh, when the when somebody doesn't admit there is a problem that is when the then that becomes a problem okay then how can i follow you in future should i follow you at all what should i do so that was one point i wanted to appreciate raising vulnerability in in terms of our contemporary or our traditional vocabulary that's very helpful i hadn't thought you know, about it in those terms yeah um, false expectation also you're expecting someone to know something that they that they it's not part of their job description so when they were building the vrindavan temple surabi became surabi maharaj he was the architect and he was asking prabhupada a question about architecture and prabhupada's answer was why are you asking me you're the architect use your common sense so um another time uh, a duoti i knew had a, a a problem medical problem and prabhupada was a chemist so she asked shruti kirti to ask prabhupada if he had a cure for this and shruti kirti came back and he said prabhupada said i am not your doctor i am your guru go see a doctor so you know we were thinking prabhupada's everything and um there are stories uh, i don't know if you've known this story when prabhupada was in mayapur i was there so this must have been 1975 and he was either i can't remember it was either in class or chanting jai radha madhava he went in ecstasy and he stopped and as he stopped chanting or stopped talking i get mixed up because it happened twice i remember he was chanting jai radha madhava and he stopped and we're all sitting there and prabha just stopped his eyes are closed and we could see he was in ecstasy so after about 2 minutes hansa duda started kirtan because we were all just in silence you know but then gradually prabha came out and kirtan was over and and so then he asked prabha later he said was that the right thing to do like when when you do that and immediately prabhat apologized he said he said i don't do that often um he wasn't making an excuse it was an actual apology like because this is you should not exhibit this publicly so prabhat was apologizing another i'm talking about vulnerability here this is public um well that wasn't in public but still vulnerability he's the guru in front of his disciples and he said i shouldn't have done that it's not right Vrindavan day came Prabhupad's son Prabhupad said your mother was very good I was not good you have a very good mother she was a very good wife I was not a good husband Prabhupad said that actually yeah he said that yeah but, but is so, there a record for this any idea where it is yeah you can find it on the veda base yeah you'll find it on the veda base um just there there's a few you know these few little clips of Prabhupad that go around where Prabhupad saying you know don't be puffed up when you offer to krishna you say what is the value of my body what is the value of my things there's no value but i'm offering this to you please accept and prabhat's crying you remember you know that you've heard yeah. that yeah yeah so people send those little clips so here that's vulnerability he's crying and you know 300 devotees 500 devotees he's crying 
Prabhupada, the lecture on Bhakti Siddhanta's disappearance day, it may have been 1969 in Los Angeles. And he said, you know, today is a special day and, and so on and so forth. And then Prabhupada says, but I have to thank you more. Because, because Prabhupada felt his disciples are the ones who were helping him spread Krishna consciousness. And so Prabhupada said, but I have to thank you more. And, he, and then he choked up. He said, because you're helping me fulfill the order of my Guru Maharaj. And he started crying. Vulnerability. There was, there was so much vulnerability on Prabhupada's part. Listen to this story. This is amazing. Prabhupada is so speaking. Minute, at, if you don't mind, you know. Oh, yeah. I would ahead. say that, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Vulnerability is a beautiful topic, and maybe we could discuss it separately. Sorry, <laughs> I can see that you're in ecstasy. Because I feel that there are a lot of well, I'm, I'm trying to connect it. I'm trying to connect it in the sense that what the way you brought it up is that you know yeah. connect it to the sensitivity of the leader. Yes. And so I think we're saying when he's vulnerable, there'll be more trust, better relationship. And yes. I think if we're vulnerable, we're more sensitive to the to the the challenges. If we're more honest about our own vulnerability, then we're we're naturally more sensitive to the vulnerabilities of the people we're administering to. And then that makes us better leaders. And oh, okay. it, it endears us. I mean, that's kind of where we were going with it. So, because yes, yes. I was saying in my experience, there's a lot of problems in ISKCON that are not actually coming from the devotees, but they're, they become problems for the devotees if the, le the leader creates a problem. Like, you know, when, when the first gurus left, the crazy idea was being taught that, well, you're not sincere, that's why your guru left, or you're sinful and you caused him to fall down. You know, he's like blaming the disciple for it. Yeah, just, and, and you know, that tendency to blame the disciple, like it's always, the, it's always a subordinate's fault. And I'm not saying every leader is not perceptive or empathic or sensitive, but often when a leader is not in every way or doesn't know, you know, is trying to instruct in areas that he's not expert in, it's not his job. He creates problems for his disciples or the people under him. So a lot of a lot of that, I can't trust myself. We may be made to think that way. What do you know? You're just a young devotee. Just listen to what I say, you know, something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So then you shut off your intuition because the leader thinks you know, he doesn't understand that yeah. Krishna's guiding even the youngest devotees. And I just want to add one more thing and then, Yes. Um, I was in I was in charge of Sankirtan party, and what we would do on our day off is we would write our realizations, and then we would go around the room, and we'd listen to devotees' realizations. And I remember distinctly. So this was 1976. So I would say most devotees were like three to four years in the movement, and you know, like 25. And the realizations they had were amazing, like incredible. And I did listen to the realization, and I would think, "You're such a young devotee." How do you have these realizations? So it's not that young devotees don't have deep realizations. You know, look at, they're distributing books, they're running temples, doing so many things. We ran temples, you know, you're in the movement. So I'm kind of preaching, saying this to leaders who might be listening, you know, um, to, you know, put more trust and faith in the, in the guidance that younger people get. And, and Prabhupada let us make mistakes. Go out and do this. You know, did he think we'll make a mistake? Yeah, but he let us make mistakes because he knew we would learn by that. So I think that's another important principle. You know, trust, trust your people. Let them, let them try and fall. They'll learn. They'll get up. Krishna will help them. Krishna will guide them. Powerful. Yeah, I've seen young devotees can also have amazing realizations. And this last point you made that Prabhupada sometimes let devotees make mistakes and learn from them. Yes, can you give yes. an example of that? Yeah, I'm an, I'm an example. I'll give you myself. So um, in August of 1970, which was exactly eight months after I had become a devotee and I was 20 years old, I was asked to temporarily go to Vancouver, Canada to help the temple there. The president was temporarily temporarily gone. So I went there, tried to inspire the devotees. And I'm a, you know, I tend to be an enthusiastic person. So um, after I left and went back, the other temple president came. And the devotees were very, very inspired by me. 
And they and they wrote the temple president of my temple, and they said, we would like him to come back because we're very inspired. And then they said something really heavy, like Krishna's arrangement, with, I guess Krishna wanted me there. He said, if he doesn't come back, we'll leave the temple. <laughs> and when I was there in August, I thought, I never would want to live here. And now they're telling, telling my authorities, we're all going to leave this temple if Mahatma doesn't come back. So I had to go back, right? So I went back and I got to write Prabhupada every month because there wasn't GBC then. So we would write directly to Prabhupada and you know, report so many books, so many devotees. And so I sometimes would ask questions. And so I asked, asked a question about running the temple. And, um, and Prabhupada said, you should feel completely incapable of running the temple and always pray to Krishna to give you guidance. And you should think that if Krishna doesn't guide you, all the devotees in the temple will leave. Like the whole temple will fall apart if Krishna doesn't guide you. So he was, you could see how Prabhupada had so much faith in, in, in Chaita Guru guiding us because he would put such young devotees in charge of his temples and then just tell them, pray to Krishna, he'll give you guidance if you're sincere. And then, and then many devotees started joining and Prabhupada uh, had wrote the, uh, another leader there. He said, well, Mahatma must be sincere. Otherwise, why would Krishna send so many devotees? I'm not saying that to prove I'm sincere, but the same point where Prabhupada's saying, Krishna will help you, he'll guide you if you're sincere. So that Prabhupada, I, I feel strongly that Prabhupada felt any of us who are sincere, he could give us loads of responsibility. And he knew Krishna would guide us. He would give us intelligence how to do things. Now, we didn't have huge responsibilities. And I don't recommend people taking huge responsibilities in areas that are totally unqualified, like managing millions of dollars and you don't know how to do it, or managing a guru call and you have, you have no idea how to do it. But in these simple temple situation, it wasn't that difficult. And 20 years old, one, one year, year and a half in the movement. So I always felt helpless. <laughs> Krishna, I don't know what to do. I never got any training how to do this. You want to hear a funny story? You're going to yes, love this sorry, story. Yes, how were you connecting yeah. this with, like, make a mistake and Prabhupada, let us learn from our mistakes? What was the connection? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because in one sense, because, because Prabhupada was willing to put, he was willing to put young devotees in charge of temples. And just tell them pray to Krishna for guidance. Oh, so he was he was he was like allowing us. It wasn't like here's your training man, manual, and, and I'm not putting down the GBC college. We need these things, but in those days there was no training manual. The training manual was be sincere, chant good rounds, do the Draupadi method, put your hands up in the air and pray pray for Krishna to guide you, and he will. So here here's a funny story. And then uh, I just want to say this before I forget. It. It's so funny. So in those days, we had deities and we didn't have many devotees. So all the devotees would engage in deity worship. You imagine, you know, you have Gornitai, Radha, Krishna, and Jagannath, and the temple has like 15 devotees, right? So you, you do the math. Everybody's either cooking or dressing one or two days a week or doing a few artiques. So... We didn't know how to cook. We're just like young American men, you know. We don't even we don't know how to cook. We never had to cook, or maybe we know how to take something out of a can and heat it up. I mean, seriously, or you know, that's about what we know. And so we go in the kitchen and we'd say, "How do we cook?" And they would say, "Pay dandavats on the floor and pray to Krishna, and He'll guide you." That was the mood. You know, that was that was our cooking class. That one minute dandavat on the floor was was the cooking class. So. That was the mood. <laughs> okay. I mean, I thought a slightly different question. That is, in one sense, okay. it's quite adventurous about how young devotees did so many things for Prabhupada's mission. But somebody could say that was because of circumstantial necessity. Prabhupada didn't have any alternatives. But yes. is there some example of Prabhupada knew that somebody was doing something which was wrong, but he allowed it to happen because that was the only way the devotee could learn. I thought that's what we meant by let us make mistakes yeah. and learn. From them. Uh, well, he, I don't think he would have allowed us to. He, Prabhupada was very upset if we did anything that would be harmful or disturbing to the other devotees. Okay. So then he would intervene. So he, 
you know, when I say make mistakes, like you remember in the early days, they gave money for, I think, an apartment and the guy cheated them and probably said, well, you're just young, you don't know. But so they learned. And he said, well, it's your, you made the money, you earned it. So he was willing us, he was, he was willing to let us learn. And of course, as we progressed, he would expect more from us. And he would expect more from his most trusted, you know, disciples, GBCs, sannyasis. But to send somebody who's 20, who's only been a devotee a year, a little over a year. No, and I wasn't even a devotee a year. I was a, when I took over the temple president, I've been a devotee 10 months. 10 months, okay. Yeah, it was, I joined in January and I officially took over the temple in, I think, November. But I first went in August, which was eight months. So my, my understanding, my perception was, was if Prabhupada felt some of us sincere, he knew they would be successful and the mistakes they make wouldn't be huge generally. But if they were making huge mistakes, he would definitely take them out as we saw with Guru Kula. So it's not, you know, there's always this caution, don't, you know, don't put a 20 year old who knows nothing in charge of 200 children who knows nothing about education and raising children. You know, that's, that's dangerous, of course. You know, so, so and about Gurukul, you're saying that Prabhupada actually stopped someone? Because that's well, one of when the- When he found out, yeah, when he, when he found out that they were harming the children, he was really, really upset. Yeah. yeah, really, really upset. But we also know that when Chaturani wanted to take art classes, Prabhupada said, no, just paint. Don't take art classes, just paint. Krishna will guide you. So, okay. so of that course, was I mean, this can't, this can't be absolutized. That this is the only thing that no, everybody should not take art classes at all. <laughs> be, um, yeah, well, this is, this is the, I'm glad you brought it up. Okay, so there's a balance. We have to create a balance. But I want to tell another story. So nowadays we have so many courses. You have book distribution course. We have art seminars, management, leadership. You know, we have everything. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But I think we need to balance it with this other side, sincerity. So I want to tell a story. Hmm. So two book distributors got a chance, just happened to get a chance to see Prabhupada somehow or other. And one of them had been meditating on training devotees in book distribution, like a certain way to do it. Give the, stop a person this way, give the book this way, say this, say that, say this, then ask for the donation this way, like, you know, just systematize it. Because that wasn't done, and he felt if we did it, we would distribute more books. And so they asked Prabhupada, what did he think about that? And he was, he was okay with it, but he wasn't that excited. And you know what he said? He said, it's a little artificial. Every man has, is his own genius. So, you know, there's this balance between, you know, just learning the techniques of it and the inspiration that Krishna will give you from within. And it seems that Prabhupada really catered a lot to inspiration from within because of one's sincerity, because he he liked, you know, he wasn't like, don't do the training, but it was like, it can't just be that because ultimately you have to leave room for inspiration and a devotee's own genius to come through and how he distributes books or how he does anything. So I see the balance oh, there. Okay, okay. That's where you're coming from. I understand now. So yeah. Prabhupada is saying a devotee has his own genius. In what context was it exactly? Do you remember? Because, because, because if you go out on book distribution, or, or we can apply this to, let's say, okay, you give classes. So what if I said, okay, Chaitanya Charan, Prabhu, I am going to teach you how to give a class. So you, you got to start with an icebreaker, then you got to tell a joke, then you got to tell a verse, and then you got to, you know, quote, quote a story. You know, it's like you'll say, I can't give a class like that. That's artificial. And I'll say, no, but it's been studied. This is the best way to do it. And you'll say, okay, okay, story, verse, joke. You know, and say, okay, I got it, but but I need to do it. I'll incorporate it, but it's got to be natural and it's got to come out my own way because I have my own style. 
Every man is his own genius. I can't do it your way because it doesn't work for me. It's okay. It's, I understand where you're coming from. You know, it's like, you know, you know, some of the best classes I've ever given, I didn't study for purposely. I just prayed because sometimes when I get in the zone, so to speak, you know, I mean, it's 52 years since I've been a devotee. I, you know, do I have to study deeply before every class? Maybe yes, maybe no. A lot of times I purposely don't. And I pray to Krishna, what do these people need to hear? What's going on for them? And sometimes those are my best classes, you know, totally unprepared. I'm a very spontaneous person. So it works for me. You know, like, what are you going to say? They'll say, what, we're driving to a program and say, what are you going to say tonight? And my nature is, I don't know until I see the people. Once I see them, I'll know what to say because I'm spontaneous. I have to see them and feel them. So that's what works for me. Maybe for you, you say, no, I have my PowerPoint. I'm, I know exactly what I'm going to say. And, and let's say if I'm restricted to the PowerPoint, then it's like, oh, I got to say what's on the, I have to say what's on the slide, but I can't get spontaneous because now I'm getting a realization and I don't want to say what's on the slide. I want to go with this train of thought because sometimes it's better than what's on the slide. So that's me. So that's what Prabhupada meant. He said, okay, but you know, you, you can't conform everybody to do it exactly the same way because they're individuals and they have their own genius. And that, you know, that seems to be a theme in Prabhupada's training of his devotees, at least one of the themes. Oh, okay. At least according to me. Yeah, so rather than you were saying downplaying training, your point is also emphasizing the the fact that everybody is an individual, not just everybody, but everybody will get some ability, some talent, some inspiration from the super soul within them. And then that is where that, that also needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, I fully agree that, that you know, if somebody tells give a class like this, I just can't. Some devotees, <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially some young devotees, they feel very empowered. Okay, these are the notes. These are the points you speak. And they will take those notes and maybe they will add some more or maybe some their own stories, their own examples. But they feel empowered when they are given a structure for a class. But yeah, I don't yeah, feel empowered. Yeah. I feel constricted. I can't speak yeah. like this. Yeah, so yeah. I think there's I, individuality. Me too. I, I, come, I come to a class sometimes. I think, okay, there's a lot of senior devotees. I should prepare. I have everything. And, it, and I have like six pages. And it's rare that I read even three paragraphs. I just start. I get inspiration you know, while I'm talking, and I don't need the notes. I mean, it's nice to have, but it, it often becomes a much different class than I intended. And then, you know, you've given so many classes, you know, people say, they come up and say, did you know what was on my mind? Did you know what I was thinking? And I, and I would say, no, Krishna knew. And so he made me speak. Like, like Mahaprabhu said, uh, or, or Ramananda Roy Goswami. said, and it's yeah, well, you're playing, you're, you're playing the strings, I'm speaking. And uh, Mahaprabhu, when he was asked to explain the Atmarama verse for the second time, he said, I can't remember what I said. Um, I'm one madman. And, you know, Sarvabhoma um, is another madman. And so, so then he spoke again, all new realizations, um, because the audience draws it out of you, you know, spontaneously, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and in fact, there, he gave more meanings at that time, the second time, although he said, I yeah, can't yeah. remember what I spoke, but he gave yeah. 64 meanings second time. Yeah. So, but, but the whole, where this discussion came from, in case we, you lost track, where this discussion came from, it came from the leaders, you know, the whole, what does it mean to empower? Empower means go do it. You know, I can't do it. It'll never happen. No, you can do it. I want you to do it. I want to get it done in two weeks. Ah, so you've just empowered them and say, no, I trust you. You can do this. I know you can do it. Prabhupada had trust in us. He was making us do things we didn't think we could do. That's empowerment. Telling us Krishna will guide us. So I'm saying that um, if a leader is putting doubts in us and think, oh, yeah, I don't know anything, I can't think straight, then we've created a cult, a bona fide cult with mindless people who can't think, who are overly dependent on authority. It's not to undermine authority. It's not to think, my guru, what does he know? You know, I'm inspired. But um, the intelligent guru leader will inspire and let people run with their inspiration. 
And, and do you know, when Prabhupada was in America, he didn't manage like he did in India because America was our country and India, we were lost. We didn't know, we we're just getting cheated. You know, we don't, he's, so in America, he hardly did management. He said, you know, it's America, you know what to do here. And we come up with so many ideas and he would say, yeah, strain your brain. Just, he, and so many projects that we did, probably your generation thinks they were all Prabhupada's projects, but they weren't all his projects. They were, so many of them were our projects. You know, we get an idea, let's get a bus, turn it into a temple, then we, the bus is coming to the people. That wasn't Prabhupada's idea. He loved the idea when we told him we were doing it. Even the first Guru Kula, you could say it was Prabhupada's idea in his books, but the devotee who started it read in his books that children should be educated, and he got the idea. Prabhupada, we should start a Guru Kula. Yes, yeah, very good idea. So there, there's so many things happen because of our inspiration. And you know, Malati finding Jagannath, you know, somehow, you know, how did that happen? She, you know, yeah. Why Jagannath? She didn't know who Jagannath. So all these things. So if you if you studied the history, you'll see how Prabhupada was just like, yeah, do it, do it, go for it, go, yeah, organize this, organize that. You know, as it, what do we know? You know, it was just like so much fun. We we're organizing all these big programs for the first time in our life. It's so, amazing. Because you know, Prabhupada's behind us. Do it, do it, go for it, you can do it. It's amazing. Again, you know, you're giving a very uh, fascinating twist to a familiar motif. So what I'm, I'm trying to say here by this is that generally we've all heard about how devotees were extraordinarily empowered and did extraordinary things. But quite often this is explained as the power of faith in the Guru's instructions, not so much as the Guru trusting the disciple. Yeah. It, it is that if you have faith, impossible things will happen. Don't let your logical mind come in between. So how could Prabhupada, many of, Prabhupada, many of the devotees think that Prabhupada attempted, they were from a, you could say from a circumstantial logical perspective, they might have seemed very impossible, but they happened. So this is not seen or this is not usually explained as Prabhupada trusting disciples as much as disciples trusting Prabhupada. So, uh, well, I can add to that. And, but they say they go together because I trust Prabhupada he tells me I can do it, so then I trust myself. <laughs> so it, it kind of went in that circle, you know? Because Prabhupada was always, he was always behind us encouraging us, do this, and we're thinking we can't, but we trust him, so then we get confidence in ourselves because he's giving it to us, and we trust him, so then we trust ourselves. <laughs> mm, that's beautiful. So it's like, it was like perfect, the perfect circle, mm. you know? Um, so, but also so one more us, point, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So one more point you made is that again, so there's one thing is the instruction originating from Prabhupada and then we can say that, okay, if Prabhupada is giving this instruction, then that Prabhupada trusts you. But another point which yes. you made, which is very significant, that it is devotees came up with the idea and Prabhupada appreciated it. Yeah, turning yes. bus into a temple, yeah. I think turning a yeah. truck into a rathya, rath car, that was Prabhupada's idea. Prabhupada saw a flatbread yeah. truck and he said, let's convert into rath. Well, but, but well this, you know, the first Hari Nam, the Hari Nam parties that were going out in San Francisco, it was the devotees' idea. Did you know that? <laughs> on on Lord Chaitanya's appearance day, like I think six, 1967, the devotees said, well, let's go out of the temple. They're doing Kirtan in the temple. So let's go down the street to Prabhupada's apartment. And so they went chanting down the street to Prabhupada's apartment. And Prabhupada said, good, continue. So, you know, he didn't even tell them to do that. They did it. So, um, a lot of times when things like this would happen, Prabhupada would say, oh, Krishna inspired you to do this. Krishna was telling, you know, he would, that, was, that was a common theme, Krishna was guiding you in this, young devotees. So um, the, the worst thing for me to see is devotees doubting their own intuition and doubting their own abilities. And I always tell them, well, it's not even your ability, you know, Krishna, Krishna will empower you. So. Don't doubt his ability. And it's okay to fail. Uh, so if Prabhupada's empowering us, okay, it's okay to fail as long as there's no ramifications where everyone else is gonna, anyone else is gonna suffer. But you try, you fail, it's okay. When a devotee would fail, often Prabhupada would say, well, what are you gonna do now? He wouldn't chastise them. Generally, he would say, what are you gonna do now? What's the solution? Where do we go from here? And they'd give a solution. And he'd say, okay, do it. So it was like, 
you know, fail, 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 you'll succeed, you'll succeed. Prabhupada knew that. Mm, amazing. As long as it wasn't sinful and, you know, against principles, it was like, and then, you know, you go out all day, you distribute one book, he would never make you feel bad. Never. Like, why do you only distribute one book? What's wrong with you? You're useless. You know? Never like that. Very good. Continue in this way. Krishna will give you intelligence. So, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to cycle back to our topic of Vienna. So, beating the mind does not mean distrusting oneself. And Prabhupada yes. also didn't mean obedience to distrust oneself. Rather, obedience means that you trust yourself to your own sincerity, Krishna's guidance, to find out how to do it. Now, well, how, how about this? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to complete okay. this then. So then okay. there's, a, there's a question. There's, a, there's one, again, this is an oversimplification, but I would like your clarification on this, that, that don't question you don't use your intelligence to question what your authority is telling you to do. Use your intelligence yeah. to question how to do it. Yeah. That is the authority. Okay. So, but sometimes what the authority may tell itself may be questionable. So yeah. if you want to go in that direction. Yeah. So um, I trust myself to know, I trust myself enough to know if something wrong is in my mind, I have to beat it out. How about that? How about that paradigm? Instead of, oh, my mind, beat, beat, beat. Okay, how do I know what to beat out of it? And how do I know what to keep into it? Because I understand what Krishna consciousness is. So I trust myself to discriminate what to beat out and what to leave in. You can see it that way, right? So it's not, really put. It, it's not a lack of, it's, it's not a, like low self-esteem. I can't, I just beat my mind. Everything that comes in is bad. But Prabhupada's saying, you know, calm, love, cold, mahat, like, don't trust that. Those things sit in the mind. So when they show up, it's your enemy. Don't, don't trust your enemy. But you have the intelligence to discriminate what is beneficial for you and what isn't. Right? Mm. What to beat and what not to beat. So, um, that's powerful. The, you know, when, and uh, once I wrote an article and, um, it was, uh, I was talking about, you um, probably know that I have a physical handicap and I was talking about how my parents took care of me very well. They never made me feel burdened. So I had written that, that, you know, my, my parents taught me to trust myself in spite of my physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. So one devotee read that and he says, this is, this is, as a devotee, you should not be writing trust yourself. We are meant to trust Guru and Krishna, <laughs> not trust yourself. So... It once says in terms of the lack at that time, this was very, I was maybe four or five years only in Krishna consciousness at that time. So, in terms of uh, language, I felt, yeah, that's what we hear don't trust yourself, trust Guru and Krishna. But I felt something wrong over here. If I didn't trust myself, how would I even have taken up Krishna Bhakti? Because it's a big leap. Yes. And yes. then it's a decision I have taken. So, I think distrusting ourselves is not the meaning of obedience. Yeah. I mean, so um, sometimes we don't trust ourselves. But we're smart enough to know what to trust and what not to trust. So as long as you can make a discrimination and it's not like, I don't trust anything, then you're in trouble. But if you know how to discriminate between what to trust, what is, what is going to help you and what's going to hinder you, then yeah, then it's a perfect balance. Because we don't, we're not going to say trust everything, even, even all the things that are detrimental to you. But you have discrimination. So you see, yeah, I'm not going to. You just say, that's just my mind. That's my past conditioning. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on my goals, my intentions. And I'm going to go in that direction. So I'm not trusting that. I'm disregarding it. I'm beating it. But I'm not beating everything out of my mind. I'm not going to beat the good stuff, right? I'm not going to beat the inspiration and the intelligence and guidance Krishna is giving. So, so, now, so you're saying to dis to you have to be able to discern between the two. And one way to discern is that some things are very easily identifiable. Like this is last greed. If I want to overeat yeah. far more, if I want to overeat far more or do something, something is easy. But if something is, say, giving us impetus to serve Krishna, then to call it whimsicality that, or to, 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 to beat that down, that would be unhealthy. So you could say yeah, that's it's a gray zone in between. But at least for some things we can know this, I shouldn't be beating this down. Say, for example, if I get an idea to write an article, I can't beat yeah. that down saying that that's my mind speaking. So, uh, 
So can yeah. you it's the point for the guidelines of how to differentiate between when to be yeah. and when not to be. Yeah. Ano kuliasya sankalpa pratikulasya varjan. What's favorable? What's unfavorable? That's the universal principle for bhakti. You can answer so many questions with this these first two lines of this verse. What should I do in this situation? What's is it favorable? If it is favorable, do do it, or do what's favorable. If it's not, don't. And don't do what's unfavorable. So I think I think you're pointing to the point where someone may have so much self doubt they think everything is unfavorable, and when that's not true. So if you use this as a as a checklist, okay, is it favorable or not? It starts to make it easier. And I think the, but the next question you're asking is a little more subtle and more difficult because your authority is saying it's unfavorable, and you're saying it's favorable. Now what do you do? Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, one of this going back to earlier point, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, so okay. You, know, you had mentioned earlier about uh, about you know having a the guru or the temple president as the guide or whoever it is. You know, one thing which is different, we could say in our in Iskon, or at least in the what are the normative, what are the standard stories of Iskon successes, is that in the traditional Indian culture or not just Indian culture, you could say. If a traditional like Rama and Mahabharat, it's not that the particular characters outsource their intelligence to their guru. Like uh, yeah. Yudhishthir, he himself doesn't have any in the forest when he's meeting the sages. He asks many of those sages questions. You know, why did such a calamity befall me? And it's not that one sage mm -hmm. answer is authoritative. He asks different different sages, and they give different perspectives. And each of yeah. them in its own way benefits him. So the idea of having multiple, uh, like multiple senior devotees or multiple wise people to consult and then take what once what works for one. Hmm? Yeah. That is more in the tradition. And maybe within our movement, uh, our, our movement started in the way when Prabhupada was a single-handed pioneer. And Prabhupada, there is no, no equals to Prabhupada that devotees had access to or no equals that that you know worked with Prabhupada. Some of Prabhupada's god brothers started uh, poaching his disciples and Prabhupada put a stop to that strongly by telling don't consult them. So in that sense, we could, could we say that Prabhupada's books focus more on the idea of one spiritual master and one authority, but in real life, we, we our tradition also has gurun. In the prayer itself is vandeham guru, not just guru. I have a yeah. whole body of gurus. So sometimes we may have to consult multiple people and then decide what is actually anukul for us and move forward i think i think it it may be because of the way the organization started and and it, it made it made us seem like okay Prabhupada's authority then you have gbc then you have temple president and you have your sankirtan leader and the temple commander so that was functional that was you know to make things work you have to have some system but the tradition is you take Diksha and then your Diksha Guru says, learn Puja from this Siksha Guru, learn Shastra from this Siksha Guru, learn this Seva from this Siksha Guru. So that that's our that's our system. And and that's that's what you do when you have a very strong inclination that you should do a certain service or you should be in, engaged in a certain way. And your authority is saying no. You should do this other thing. And this other thing, you're feeling this will be very bad for you. So then you go to another senior and say, this is how I feel. Am I right? Am I wrong? How would you guide me? And, and you want to check. Maybe he says, you're wrong. And you start to think, oh, yeah, maybe I am wrong. Or maybe he says, no, I agree with you. Let's talk to your authority. So that's our tradition. Especially if you feel very strong about something. I have a story for you. This is a really important, important. It's a really good story. I don't want to mention any names or details to protect this devotee, but he was a sannyasi and he was a GBC uh, and he was in charge of the temple and he was, he was worn out and he couldn't go on in that managerial position. And he was, he was feeling very weak. No, so he wasn't GBC, but he, I think he was, you know, maybe zonal something in charge of some zone. And mm -hmm. and so he went to his GBC and said, I, I need a break. I need just I need to go to India like for a month and recuperate. 
And, you know, they had so much going on that was dependent on him. They said, no, no, you're the only one. Don't give in to this weakness, etc. Just keep going. You're just, it's just an internal problem. Mm -hmm. And so he followed that authority and he actually ended up falling down and had to give up his sannyas. Where we can't say what would have happened if he would have just gone to India for a month, but I, I would bet my money he would have been fine. He just, he just, he's a very good devotee. He just needed, he was in a, he burned himself out and he needed to rejuvenate himself. And in that weakened state, circumstances were unfavorable and then he got into a bad situation. And I'm sure that's not the only, he's not the only one that that's happened to. So sometimes you just know this is not good and, and you want to be able to, to be able to talk to others and uh, who you think can understand that to communicate to your authorities. Because, because ultimately, Anukulyasa Sankapa, you have to do what's favorable. Prabhupada said, save yourself first. So we're not saying don't follow authorities, you know, be whimsical. We're saying on those occasions when the intuition is very strong, don't do it. Many women I know were told to marry. Marry this guy, he's, he's this, you're this. All the leaders are saying marry. Their intuition is, I don't think it's going to work. They do it anyway. Well, the leaders are saying it must, it must work. They do it, it doesn't work. There's a long list of devotees in, these, in this situation. And so that's, that's my particular concern. Not that I don't want people to follow authority. But those, sometimes authorities, they also are giving instructions about something they have no experience of. You know, you have a particular challenge, emotional, psychological, or you have some trauma from the past. They don't understand it. And they're just saying, just chant Hare Krishna, you won't be bothered by it. But it's not like that. You know, the holy name is not always a therapeutic tool. And, and they may think it is, and, it, and, it, and it, was, it was a bad instruction, and the devotee was damaged by that instruction. So someone who understands psychology will say, no, no, don't do that. That's the wrong instruction. So sometimes we find this in our movement. I deal with this all the time. Mm. You know, because... because the guru is not expected to know this. We're not trained as pastoral counselors. I think we should be, but we're not. So we don't understand a lot of these things. And that's where some of the bad advice comes because we don't understand the chat. We may not understand the emotional, psychological challenges that some people have. Mm, yeah, and we just like think, well, just chant, chant, it'll go away. That's our philosophy. Yeah, but chanting is not necessarily the tool to um, cure trauma. I have a god brother who was traumatized in Vietnam. And, and he's still traumatized, and he probably chants 64 rounds a day. So, you know, these things need to be understood. Mm. Have you seen similar things in your experience? Oh, very true, bro. I mean, it can be... Uh, see, I am more of a, you could say, intellectual person. So, I have not, by Krishna's mercy, I have not had many psychological traumas. But I could say I have had intellectual traumas when I had some really <laughs> serious questions. And I was told, you know, this is just this 4.40, some shayatma vinashyati. The doubting soul will be destroyed. Stop doubting like this. Uh -huh. I can't stop doubting. It's my intelligence is just getting this question. And I was told, chant more, read Prabhupada's books more. These questions will go away. But no, the more I was reading, I was getting more questions. <laughs> and chanting, I was getting distracted. <laughs> so I appreciate this point that sometimes the, the authorities themselves may not be equipped to deal with a particular situation. And then and they need to have the, uh, you could say, the humility or the broad-mindedness broad to not, that when they are referring a particular devotee to someone else, that is not their failure. That is, it is not that they are, they are admitting defeat or they are, it's their personal yeah. inadequacy that not unable to deal with somebody. So this point of that there being different domains of specialization, the, and uh, the, did you say that chanting is not meant to be a psychological tool to cure trauma or something like that. That is a very powerful statement. Because sometimes we think chanting, chanting like a magic wand that will deal with everything. Yeah. I mean, there's no Shastric evidence that the, the, whole, the holy name, you know, it removes anarthas. You know, Nama Bas removes anarthas. So people think, okay, well, all your traumas will be removed. But um, not exactly. That's not exactly what the anarthas are. And Yes, that's and, such a powerful it, point. It, it, Sorry. And it might remove them. You know, that's possible. We're not going to say it wouldn't, but definitely not for everyone because there's no Shastric evidence that this is the tool for, you know, neurosis, psychosis, schizophrenia, 
trauma, panic attacks, and so forth. You know, hmm. it's you know, I have I have a disciple. He was he's I think he was in Afghanistan. He's really completely traumatized, and he's got a. He said, "Okay, if I chant good rounds, get up every day, it contains it. If I don't, I'll go crazy." So it is containing it through the regulation, but the process of healing that could take many years. And he has to have therapy also. So this, you know, some devotees don't understand trauma. They don't understand what it is. Yeah, this um, is a very good point, Prabhu. That there's a sorry to interrupt you again. Just same time to differentiate. See, most devotees will understand that uh, that if I have a physical fracture, chanting is not going to cure that. I have to go to a doctor right. and get it operated. Yes. You know? But somehow yes. we think that when it is said manastrayate iti mantra that mantra yeah. frees you uh, frees you from all the problems of the mind i think even there we have to sort of distinguish between layers what the mantra does is it removes the anarthas yeah. but if there are psychological yeah. wounds because as if somebody has been traumatized somebody has been abused yeah. then we sometimes we need to treat them like uh, like physical wounds and uh, now i read a yoga psychology book long ago Uh, which says that there are i haven't found any shastrik reference i wrote to that author also he didn't respond he says that there are three levels of mind there is the outer mind which interfaces with the with the physical body then there is the mind proper middle mind they call it and it's uh, and then there is the inner mind which interfaces with the with the consciousness the soul so mm. i found that explanation quite interesting so the so the in terms of the inner mind you could say where the by the last anger greed anartha samskaras are there they will be cleansed by the by the practice of bhakti but the outer mind where somebody has been affected somebody has been traumatized that may need practical treatment so in that outer mind because yes. it's so close to the body so it's almost like not entirely but almost like a part of the body and it may need treatment the way a bodily treatment is required you know it's not that just like chanting hari krishna is not a replacement for ayurveda so similarly chanting chanting hari krishna may not be a replacement for psychological for some treatment appropriate healing for emotional wounds yeah and it might it might work for some emotional or psychological problems but we shouldn't generalize that it would mm. necessarily work for everybody in every situation you know someone could say well you're not chanting shuddha nam but shuddha nam gives prema you know so it's it never said shuddha nam gives you know psychological health per se or once you chant shuddha nam you get along with everybody theory you know you're humble you're respectful but we all have our natures and they stay with us um and you know this point somehow i feel that is almost like blaming the victim because your yeah. your trauma is not going away because you're not chanting purely yeah that's you're very not bad. actually offering me a solution i'm I, it's not that in one day i'm going to become pure purification takes a long time so what is the solution for me during the pathway well you know what you just said actually actually makes the trauma worse if you tell somebody that if you shame someone with trauma it traumatizes them even more and now you may be doing it with good intentions but you just don't know that and so um it it's it's not fair to the person who's been traumatized who has trust in you that you will take a position of authority over them in an area that you have no experience of that you haven't studied you don't understand because if you studied it you wouldn't say that you would guide them to get help i want to tell you a funny story mm -hmm. so this one sanyasi was giving class and he was talking about grihastha life some something and he said something that one of the members of the grihastha vision team in america disagreed with so she went up to him and said maharaj it's not actually like that what you said you know she corrected him or clarified it or he said what you said was not right and then he said but well, what should i say and she said you shouldn't say anything let us talk about grihastha life he just talk about other things so i'm not saying that every sanyasi doesn't know but she felt that particular one just he didn't really understand it so i said better better don't talk about it if you don't understand it that's fine you're not we don't expect everyone to be expert at everything yeah. 
So it's always good to know what you don't know. And that way, as an authority who people are supposed to have faith in, you're careful not to um, disrupt the physical, emotional, social, intellectual health of someone by talking about something that you really aren't equipped to talk about and let other people talk about it who are. Hmm. That, that's a subtle, very, very important line. Anuttama Prabhu told me that one of the things they teach in the, I mean, he consciously designed the disciples course to include based on what he's also like, I think believe the one of the part who does the guru training services or guru, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever the specific name that he said, if the guru gives you financial advice or invest here or invest <laughs> there, now that is not something yeah. which you have to follow as if it's the guru's instruction to you right. and yeah. obey, disobeying it. So disobeying yeah. it is, is like disobeying the guru. So in one sense, we could say the authorities themselves need to be a little, could say, circumspect about what they instruct in. And yes. devotees also yes. shouldn't feel guilty if they need to, for specific issues, consult something apart, someone apart from their own, their immediate authorities or their yeah. particular authorities. Well, I mean, let's let's just be realistic. We don't have a great track record with marriages. And I think we're getting better now because there's more training. Hmm. So, you know, if chanting Hare Krishna solves all problems, you know, in another sense, I think it creates problems sometimes. You know, because we're all chanting Hare Krishna and most of us were getting divorced. So it was kind of like, oh, this marriage is bad and it's an attachment. And, you know, so like we misunderstood the process of Krishna consciousness. So it backfired. But once we started doing training, for couples, premarital counseling, and courses on marriage, and the GVT wrote a book, and there are other books, then it got better. So that's such a practical example. You know, it's like, it's in our face. My wife's a marriage counselor, and she saved so many marriages, because the devotees just didn't understand the dynamics of marriage. And once they understand, then uh, things can change dramatically. So when you're saying that chanting may create problems, it's not so much chanting that create problems, but our presumption that chanting will be the sole solution for all problems, that that is a problem. Instead of ready, being ready to take some appropriate training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand okay, something. so, th- yeah, because then I don't need to work on myself and become a better wife or husband. I just need to chant Hare Krishna and be the same bad wife and husband I, I am right now and thinking it'll just get better. Um, you know, I don't want to discount the pos- these possibilities that, you know, becoming Krishna conscious will make you a better husband and wife. I don't want to say that. I don't want anybody to think I'm saying that. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes it happens the opposite way. You're not getting better, but you think by chanting you will. But, you know, look at the, re- check your blood pressure. Well, check your blood pressure and see your marital blood pressure. Is it actually getting better or worse? Um, marital blood pressure, a nice way of looking at it. That means how strained yeah. is the relationship or how much tension the relationship yeah. causes you or the other yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. Because, because, you know, sometimes if we're not mature, we become like less human. We, we become a little fanatical and we get into our sadhana in a way that we're, we lose touch with our human needs. So then mm. your sadhana and your chanting makes it, your Kriya Hasta life becomes difficult because you have to, you have this close relationship. You can't be cold. You can't be unsympathetic. You can't I remember be a one dictator. Devotee. That's true. I remember one devotee who hears a lot of classes from a senior devotee who recommends everybody to chant 64 rounds every day. And mm. this devotee had a lot of problems in his relationships. And I recommended reading some books for him to like the, 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 the six kind that or that uh, six the languages of love. Or something like yeah, men are yeah. from Mars, but men are from Venus. Yeah. And yeah. he said, he said his first response was, oh, in reading this 200 page book, during that much time I can chant 200 rounds. What that you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, don't get married then. You know, then you don't have to read the book. That's a good answer. <laughs> for that for those devotees, you know, living in a cave is the best place for you, you know, because <laughs> And just chant all day and not interact with anybody. But if you're going to interact, you better learn how to do it. So mm-hmm. I think I think we'll see future generations of leaders much more capable 
because they'll be more aware of these of of these realities based on our past experience and become more mm. capable of dealing and and understand what they don't understand that understand. others may understand better and they mm. can teach them but it's not just i would say devotees teaching but also devotees the way we are learning so sometimes we may have a very reductionistic conception of bhakti that bhakti means chanting but bhakti could also yeah. mean learning the skills or uh, abilities or uh, resource is by which i can serve krishna better so if i can if if i can be a better husband or a better wife or even a better parent or a better counselor by reading something then it's not that i'm not doing bhakti when i'm reading that book so yeah. it is that this 200 rounds chanting is bhakti and reading this 200 page book is not bhakti that may be actually a reductionist conception of bhakti itself isn't it yeah so 200 years from now when people are watching this podcast they're thinking why are they talking about this i don't understand whether to, did, did they not understand this then did they you know they're going to look back at these and think did they not have common sense then what this is not even an issue this, you know what i mean do you ever feel like that yeah like we're talk, like why we have to talk about this is just so obvious you know and someone say no but shastra says this and that i think in a few hundred years people will look back at this and and they'll say i don't believe i can't believe they actually thought like that that they needed to talk about these things that's how i feel <laughs> that's true okay so this is where yeah. common sense comes in yeah what yes. is required for service and in one yeah. sense if that same devotee is told to build a temple they won't say that i'll chant at the temple will be built they will have to consult an architect yeah. learn something about architecture yeah. so yeah. so it seems that with respect to you could say interacting with gross matter like say physical treatment or building temple we understand that we need to learn some skills but yes. when it comes to subtler things we think that chanting will do it all but yeah. uh, even the subtle is also material it's not exactly spiritual yeah yeah mm. yeah you know one could argue well you don't have faith in the holy name you know my my point is whatever you may say the problem is oh you're making nam aparad if you didn't you know would solve all your traumas say so whatever the case is i'm traumatized now and it's getting in the way of my bhakti and my relationship so i need to heal it and somehow or other my chanting's not is not enough it's a lot it's helping me spiritually but i need more help i think that's just a very simple way of looking at it if you need help you need help and you know don't feel bad oh i must be a bad devotee because i'm i need help you know psychological help i i i deal with so many devotees that have so many issues that they came to the movement with that are unhealed and it is always shows up in bad relationships that's when they realize it it's when they get married it all comes out or when they're working closely with other devotees so for me from my perspective these things are just obvious and we and when they get some counseling proper guidance or if they need therapy then they get so much better and then their devotional service gets better because they're steady and their relationships get better mm. you know i had this realization once it was it came from maybe 10 years of doing japa retreats and i started thinking why would somebody be lazy with their japa you know whenever i ask devotees do you know how to improve your japa write three ways and they write three ways i'm going to give you one minute to write three things you could do to improve your japa everybody can write it in like 20 seconds they know what to do so my next question is why aren't you doing it if you know if it's on the top of your head and say i'm lazy uh, you know you know basically they you know the honest ones honest ones just say i'm lazy okay so then i say all right you know if you don't chant well it's not good for you it's harmful yes i know you know if you chant well it's good for you yes i know so do you think this has anything to do with your self love self compassion how you take care of yourself and the lights go off and they realize i said if you don't you think if you cared for yourself more you would chant better rounds and everybody gets it 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 makes sense I want to tell you a story this is so interesting this this I, I was traveling in this one woman that I knew young woman 
She said, I need to talk to you. She said, when we were getting ready for Janmashtami for like three days, I didn't chant my rounds. You know what I asked her? I asked her this question, totally threw her off. I said, did your parents neglect you when you were growing up? And she's like, yeah, why are you asking that? I said, did you feel like you weren't really worth you know, taking care of yourself because they didn't? And she said, yeah. I said, that's why you didn't chant your rounds. And she immediately got it. It's like the lights went off. Yeah, I don't care about myself. So something like that, subtle psychology that you just don't care enough, it shows up in bad japa often. I don't want to say always, but I would just ask the listeners, think about it, how your psychology, I gave a whole series of talks, how your psychology affects your japa, because I saw these connections, you know, lack of determination, tamagun, you know, your psychology isn't tamagun, it's not good for you. So mm -hmm. I don't think you, you can't, you know, I think these are important things to look at. And these are just some realizations I got. And, and because I saw, I saw devotees who were advanced, and I think they really take care of their sadhana, they're really, you can really see they care about themselves. So you know, when they chant japa, you can't talk to them, they're just that's what they do, because they're taking care at that time. I said, oh, this is, I gotta, I gotta think about this. And then you see the devotee who's not that serious and they're talking and you know, two hours later, they have four rounds done. They don't care. It doesn't bother them. They're up late at night, that night chanting bad rounds. It doesn't bother them. They don't have enough self-care. This is beautiful, Prabhu. I mean, not, I mean, not that devotees have difficulty chanting, but this understanding it's not, not all a matter of discipline. It's also a matter of one's innate sense of self-worth. That uh, yes. if, one, if one has been taught to grow up that you don't count, then if I don't count, then the things I do to care for myself also don't count. And if, yeah. if I count, then I will take care of the things that will that are necessary for me. So hmm, this is interesting. So, so isn't again, it? again, going back to, the, I'm just trying to connect this with that. If somebody is taught to distrust themselves, then eventually they may stop caring for themselves also entirely. So yeah, alien alienation could be alienation. Yeah. yeah Can you explain like, what you mean by this in this context specifically? It, it's like, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I believe anymore. I don't know what's, you ever hear someone say that? I don't know what's right, I don't know what's wrong, I don't know what I think. Because you've kind of given your whole thinking process over to someone. And if you study this, the way Prabhupada uses that giving your thinking process over is to get instructions in philosophy, which you don't understand, you need a guru to explain it, which is different than your intuition about what you need to be healthy um, your intuition towards where your inspiration is going for service, your inspiration according to what your nature is, how you be engaged. Those are different things. So I'm not saying you don't need a guru. Prabhupada's explanation is that you, 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 you have a limit of what you can understand. You can't get out of the material world on your own. You need a guru to guide you. So that's different. But when it becomes 360, then you could start thinking, I, I don't know how to think. My guru, my guru has taken away my thinking process. And um, I think you were, uh, you were talking about the process of listening and how by listening people solve problems. And this is an important tool, skill for leaders. There's a lot of times when people come with me, come to me with problems, I keep asking them questions. Why, why do you think you have this? What's the belief behind this? What do you, how do you think you could change this? I keep asking. And more times than not, I don't have to give any advice because Krishna is, by letting them talk, Krishna is guiding them. And that, that's a good lesson to them saying, you know, you, you could have done this without me. You know, Socratic method, okay, you know, what are five things you think you could do right now to improve? Oh, I could do this, I could do that. I'll tell you a joke. I did this in the Japa workshop. I flew all the way across the country in America. And I said, what are three things you can do? I'll give you one minute, they're ready to Okay, I'm gonna give you five minutes, I want 10 more things. I said, okay, now you have 13 things you could do to improve your job, but why did you fly me out here? You already knew this. Why are you paying me? 
you know. So to be able to show them that you have it within you, I think it's extremely important. And for leaders to be able to, to pull it out of people is, you know, is a, a, a very powerful teaching method that you, that you know so much, it's in you. And I'm helping bring it out. That's, that shows the super soul's guiding you, intuition. Mm-hmm. That's what I like to do when I do workshops. Like, like anything yeah. I can teach that I don't have to say, that I can give them an exercise for them to realize, I'll always defer to that. It's always a better way to teach. And it builds trust. Oh, I had it in me. That's powerful in one sense, both for the immediate situation, if somehow I feel this is my idea rather than somebody else's thing, then quite often I feel more motivated to implement it also. Yeah, exactly. And and then secondly, as you said, then, okay, I can trust myself. I I have the resources inside me to deal with problems. Yeah, so so this is in one sense you could say you're training in independent thoughtfulness. Because we say we independent thoughtful, what does that mean? Mm. Right, I'll, I'm, I want to share with you a coaching question. You'll like this. So, do you ever ask, like, someone ask you a question in class and you throw it back to them and say, well, what, what, what do you think? And they'll say, I don't know. And you say, well, if you did know, what would you say? And they'll always come up with an answer. You know, Whatever they say, I don't know. I say, well, if you did know. And my friend Akura, sometimes when he counsels, he says, someone asks a question, can you help me with this? So whatever the situation is, let's say it's in this case, let's use, for example, it's low self-esteem. So Akura Prabhu will say, well, if you were an expert on low self-esteem, how would you answer this question? And the person has to think, okay, if I were a self-esteem expert, how would I answer it? And he comes up with the answer. And usually he starts laughing because the answer is so obvious but he never thought of it because he thought, well, I don't know, I have to go to somebody else. So often the answer is there within us. And that's our philosophy, Krishna is guiding the sincere soul. So that's why I say that, you know, a lot of these problems wouldn't be there if the leaders understood. And I'm not saying they don't, but some of them don't, or some could understand more. And that way it becomes more inspiring for the disciple or the follower because they feel empowered and they won't be alienated thinking, I don't know what to think. It, a lot of spiritual masters, when they get to disciples, is just going, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? And what about this? And indecision, they don't want to give instruction because they see this person is weak. They can't make a decision. So they'll throw it back. Okay, well, what do you think about? What do you think would be better? You know, like that, to get them to start thinking. Mm, beautiful coaching question with respect to this with respect to philosophical questions we cannot throw it back but with respect to self-application questions I think in in sense throwing it back or uh, sending the question back to themselves may actually be empowering in terms of helping that devotee deal with the situation and otherwise sometimes just giving a pat answer as you rightly said toward the conclusion may actually uh, continue the weakness and dependence of that devotee Yeah. yeah Mm-hmm. And as our you can also yeah no, go ahead go ahead yeah as our movement is expanding uh, it is actually becoming difficult for even the authorities to guide devotees if we create a culture of de- dependence then the authorities yeah. are not available for guiding also so in one sense it's good for as a for the if we want our movement to expand yeah. to train devotees in independent thoughtfulness yeah, because, because if we create a culture of dependence, then when you become a leader, you'll do the same thing. It's just a disciplic succession. So you'll, you'll create that weakness in the people below you. You know, I was thinking sometimes when people ask a philosophical question, I'll say, what have, what have you been told about this? Because I want to find out why they're asking, because, you know, often they have an answer they're not satisfied with. And so you can ask them, okay, what do you think? But what have you been told? I've been told about this. What are you not satisfied about with this? Well, it doesn't explain this. And sometimes it helps them think it through. And sometimes they actually could come up with some kind of answer by thinking it through. So, you know, not always, because they may not have sufficient knowledge, but sometimes they can go deeper just by asking, what do you doubt about this? Or what, why doesn't this make sense to you? That's a very good idea. I haven't tried it till now. 
because in Try one it, sense yeah. it, it helps in making our answer more specific because sometimes otherwise yeah. we just repeat an answer which they don't find satisfactory and then they leave unsatisfied or uh, they may be asking something more specific than the question they are articulating yeah and it also helps you understand kind of the mood in that particular place or or what you know or, or you could ask is this, is this everybody's understanding does someone have another understanding and uh you know it's good to know as a teacher well what does everybody understand you know because maybe they do understand it and this is the only person who didn't or maybe nobody understands it the way you understand it and it's like oh okay so you've understood part of it there's more let me explain more and so then you can you know go right to the point that's missing so it's it makes it easier for the teacher also and more engaging as well yeah definitely this is i recognize the importance of hearing questions to understand where the audience is coming from but like yes. questioning the questions what you are doing is powerful because that helps us understand yeah. even better more even better about the mood of the place and everything yeah you know sometimes someone would ask a question and probably would say why are you asking this question because he didn't like the question it's like what's what's going on in your mind why are you asking this like what's wrong with you but um so sometimes that's also not in a challenging way necessarily but sometimes like why are you asking i i want to know why like like what's your experience do you have some bad experience or it's it's um it's it's hard for us as teachers and leaders because we've always been in this position of like we're we're the guru we're the teacher we just tell you mm. but you know it's always good in classes you create discussion okay let's hear what you think what are your realizations so that everybody feels you know like yeah my contribution is valuable i also you know i'm i'm trying to get you to think i'm trying to stimulate you what are your ideas um that's also guru you know who brings out the best in others so it's it's a little slightly different paradigm mm. but um it makes it i always think as a leader we want to make it easier for the people under us and we don't want blind followers we want people who think and i think that's that's important and we can inadvertently cause people not to think and that's a great travesty and it's not what prabhupad wanted for sure true you know i mean this is a very powerful discussion i will there's so much more to discuss but we we one or two questions i will talk because i don't want to okay. be late for you so this one thing about this interactive discussion or drawing out things from audience i heard one thing that uh, once from a devotee who prefers to have that more of up down up, top down approach he mm -hmm. said that all this is fine you know get people to open up but that's for new people you know, look at the tradition how many verses the shukadev goswami speak and how many verses the parikshit maharaj speak <laughs> you know, parikshit maharaj is not shukadev goswami is not trying to get anything out of parikshit maharaj is giving so so as far as the so the idea is that yes all this interactive you can do to get people to the level of simply hearing so that is the more advanced stage well well you just you know you all you always have to judge by the result but like you introduced me as one who tries to take the philosophy and apply it practice help people apply it practically and i do that because i see that that's not always done or it's challenging to do that and so you know i think i think what that devotee said of course is true but i think it's also his preference the way to do it and and i was just introduced to other ways of teaching that excited me i thought wow this, I will I went to some professional seminars and I saw they were turning everything over to us through exercises and we were making all kinds of discoveries um both philosophical and practical and I realized as a student in those that I wouldn't have understood those things just listening to a lecture and you know that quote Bhakti Siddhanta he said the the co the co I think I don't know if you were used the word coach he may have used the coach he said mm. the coach is more effective than the platform speakers you know because it gets in to the particulars of a person's life and you coach them in it this is personal and, coaching personal coaching more than is more important than platform speaking something like that yeah yeah and and you know 
I've given so many seminars, you know, these, I mean, these are workshops, you know, like Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, all day. And sometimes I will be with individual devotees that evening or the next day and we'll go one-on-one -on -one. and so much happens in that one-on-one -on -one if everything gels, but it's all practical application. So I was introduced to that. That's why I, I feel it's important. And again, Anukulesha, Sankha, whatever helps, why not do it? You know, if you, if people are dull, you know, they're not Prikshit marshes in your audience and they need more, then, you know, be aware of your audience. What's their capacity? You know, okay, hearing, you know, it's purifying, it's going in their ear, but, you know, how many times have you heard not to criticize? How many times you heard don't be offensive at Japa? How, um, a lot. But when we actually do the Japa retreats and we go into it and practical and get into the consciousness and it changes. When we go into the forgiveness workshop and we, why are you criticizing? What's going on inside of you? Why won't you let this go? Why are you hold? Then they start reflecting, then they drop it. And it's hard for that to happen just through a lecture. That's what, what I experience. That I need to do steps to get them to start working on it personally. Because the problem with the lecture is you're not bound to do anything. It's just you hear it and then you go. And you could do whatever you want with that knowledge, right? But in a workshop, no, we're working on this. <laughs> this is the exercise you're going to do it, like right now. Who is this person you're going to forgive? Or what's what's up with your japa? What's wrong with it? What's So, you know, there's a place for both, for sure. Well, yeah. So we could say that. This is, I like the last point. You're actually... It, if especially it's a big lecture, everybody thinks that what is being spoken is for everyone else, not for me. And I don't have to do <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to do anything about it. I already know this yeah. stuff. The yeah. workshop actually, in one sense, impels one to do some things practically. So we could yeah. even say that I, these kind of classes, even if they are not the traditional model, we could say that this is more like Bodhayanta Parasparam, what Krishna talks yeah. about 10, 11, yeah. that. Or yeah. we could say this, yeah, exactly. Vyamakhyati Pruchyati. It is so it, there is a there is a place in our tradition for that, even if it may not be, even if it may not be the standard mode of interaction described within the scriptures. Really? The, the narration might not be there, but you could say the prescription is there within the scripture for doing this kind of more horizontal yeah. interaction rather than a vertical interaction only. I mean, if it works, why not do it? I mean, you know. When Sachin Anand Swami started doing his Japa retreats, so many senior devotees attended. And so many senior devotees were enthralled by it. And they started teaching. They thought, this is so powerful. This has helped me so much. And then there were the naysayers who were like, Prabhupada never did Japa retreats. You know, why are you wasting time? You could be out on book distribution. You should be out on the street chanting, not sitting up in a, in a monastery you know, that you rented retreat center, just chanting, you know, so I understand that, you know, but if you actually did it, you, you'd think, this is the best thing I've done, you know, this was the best thing I've ever done for my japa, and so you realize, oh, yeah, we, we need, we need also to take time and spend days on one thing, and through experience, practice, and experiential, experiential, experiential exercises, so there's a place, for, you know, place for it all. You know, everything. You know, it's holistic. Not till not you mentioned that. it. It never. It had never struck me till now that Japa retreats were never done by Prabhupada. In one sense, it's yeah. so obvious. It's here is something yeah. that, like you said earlier. Two generations later, people. Will be, Why are you asking this also? You know, what could be more important than providing some supportive environment and supportive sure. discussion for doing the most important limb of our bhakti chanting? But if one starts asking for precedent for that, then that's, that's, that's an example of lacking in common sense. Yeah, fulfilling the purpose, even if the specific example may not be there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Prabhupada didn't do a lot of things that we need to do. Hmm. And every time I've done Japa workshops, online or live, it's always been an amazingly positive experience for everyone. And it's, it's just really helped them like fine tune 
their japa in a way that they can go forward and it'd be much better for the rest of their life. So that's, if it takes, you know, Prabhupada told us go to India every year for a month, five weeks, actually the festivals were five weeks, three in Mayapur, two in Vrindavan. So if he wanted us to go to India and rejuvenate for five weeks every year at the expense, at a big expense, why wouldn't he want us to spend a week a year on japa or on forgiveness or on humility or on vows or you know whatever it is we want to to understand more deeply ego in our practice that's how i think because that's my experience and like you can't a lot of things you can't go deep in an hour in a class you have to go somewhere go out in a, in a very sacred environment quiet and do it all day, discuss it, do exercises, share day after day after day. And then you start to get deeper and deeper and have realizations that you couldn't have any other way about yourself, about your practice of misunderstandings. A lot of people come out and say, I never understood that before. This is huge for me now that I understand this. That's worth five days, isn't it? Sometimes they get a big realization that could change something dramatically in your life? I think it is. Definitely. Powerful. So, uh, in one sense, again in Japa, retreat is not so much of a top-down instru instruction, but it's more of an interaction no, no, and bringing, uh, bringing no. out things gradually. I want to tell you a story. I'll tell you a story about this now that you brought this up. So the first Japa retreat, retreat I went to Sachi Anandan Swami was supposed to come, but he was ill and he couldn't come. So Hindra Swami came, Rabindra Sharup came, Jagar Purush came, and I came. And Jagar Purush had been to Burijan's shop or workshops, which started maybe earlier than even Sachi Anandan Swami's, or about the same time. So he represented that. Rabindra Sharup had so many realizations. Hindra Swami had so many realizations, and then I had uh, made presentations also. Uh, I think there were like 50 of us, you know, older devotees, younger devotees. And at the end, we would share our experience. So Yadunath, the comedian, he said, I think it was Yadunath who said, he said, this is ISKCON at its best. It was either him or a devotee named Hari Kirtan. And the reason he said it was, he said, because this was in the first time in ISKCON, there was no hierarchy. It was just all sadhakas trying to improve their japa. So even the teachers, and the students, it wasn't like this, because we're all, all the teachers are also students listening to other teachers, and we're all have the same goal of improving our japa, and we're all opening up and discussing about our challenges. So he said it was so beautiful, everything was leveled, no hierarchy, and everybody, everybody was the same sadhaka struggling to chant Shudhanam to get pure, the pure name. It was, it was very special to be in an environment like that. Nobody telling you you're wrong, you know, there was, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not speaking against authority, but for those five days, six days, with a level playing field, it created a unique, a unique environment that we're not normally experiencing, and everyone really appreciated it. You know, the teachers were, the, the teachers and the sannyasis and the GBC were all just sadhakas trying to improve their job, but we were all in the same boat. It's really, really beautiful. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. So it's uh, it's you could say it's an enhanced learning happening through a uh, through that atmosphere, and everybody comes closer to each other. In general, yes. it's it's when you it's, we can, when we hear someone, we learn a lot from them. But when there is uh, not just hearing, but uh, reciprocation, hearing, speaking, hearing, speaking, there are few things that bring people closer to each other as uh, and closer to ultimately Krishna. If you're talking about Krishna as actually having a discussion. And in one sense, Rupa Goswami calls this as one of, as two among the six characteristics of a loving ex of love itself. Yes. yes. So ultimately, we want to develop love for Krishna. And the Bhagavatam says one of the ways to develop love for Krishna is by developing for love, love for those who love Krishna. Prasanga Majaram Pasham, as he says that, you know, that attachment to material goes away when we develop attachment to the devotees. So this could also be seen in that perspective as Yes, that culture of 
of uh, of strong relationship centered on krishna by having having more of interaction and and yeah and what was and what was happening in the, along this line is the vulnerability of all the participants the seniors the juniors everyone we were, we we were all talking about our struggles openly and that's a un, that's a unique situation because usually the teacher is just teaching mm. but here the teacher is also talking about his own struggles because he's also a student part of the day and even in the presentation talking about his struggles so um it, it's it was in that sense a unique environment but it was very much appreciated and it's it's not the traditional environment right that that the teacher is going to be that vulnerable but it was the vulnerability that everyone appreciated that we could all talk openly about our challenges and that's how we 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 um improve because we can talk about what's wrong so it's it, and then and then you know it's like encouraging encouraging everybody to open up it's okay you're not going to be you know a lot of devotees say i can't open up because my authority will then you know he won't let me do this service or he'll ask me to leave the ashram or you know you know that environment um we that's not a healthy environment so this was yeah open up say whatever you have to say There'll be, there's no consequence other than you'll be listened to and purified so it's a very healthy environment mm -hmm. true so overall with respect to i think the falena parichayate is a very important i think if we want to summarize i mean we'll talk yes. more detail more, more detail summary but in scriptural terms i think two things Anukulesa Sankalpa and Falimene Parichayate. These would be very important to apply in these situations. And yes, I use, yes. we use our intuition to understand what is favorable. And ultimately, uh, what is favorable, we judge it from its results. If the result is helping us fulfilling the purpose of scripture, purpose of Prabhupada's books, purpose of our tradition, then even if it is done in a slightly different way from what it was done in the tradition. Of course, it's not different because even in the tradition, a lot of things were done which we may not highlight, but even if that um, is done, then it's helpful. It's it's it should be it can be adopted. You say that. that yeah, I'll tell you a story. A, a man, um, a man joined this He was a professor. Nineteen seventy-two or so, maybe seventy-one, seventy-two. So he was probably like thirty-five, forty which for us at that time was like a very old, like twice the age of everyone, or many of us. And he had become serious, he got initiated. His name was Ramanuja. And his fam his wife didn't become a devotee. She, she was still um, not vegetarian, feeding the children meat, and he was very bewildered. He didn't know what to do. He wrote Prabhupada. And Prabhupada's answer was, do what's favorable. He didn't give any detail. He said the principle is do what's favorable for bhakti and, and avoid what's unfavorable. So he's letting him like think it out himself. That's the principle, and you figure out how to apply that. And I think if we work on that principle, devotees will be more in touch with what they need and maybe better able to communicate with their authorities if their authorities are not in touch or don't agree because they'll be in this paradigm of this, I can see clearly this will help my bhakti. And the authority, if he doesn't agree, he would have to convince them that it's not going to help your bhakti or why we need you to do this other service and why that that is helpful. And, you know, okay, it's beneficial for the temple, how it's beneficial for you to surrender, you know, and, and, and so I think it, um, it it's, it's, a, it's a great way for a devotee to contextualize decisions. Or maybe it's the only way you could say. It's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. In one sense, again, the life, life with its complexities are so many that you cannot have just one Shastric code to deal with or a set of Shastric codes to deal with the specifics of all problems. You know, mm -hmm. I was reading in one book recently that about this is brought about the principle of dharma that Shastra says 
टू थिंग्स महाजनो ये नगता सा पंथा एंड धर्म से तत्व निहितम गुहायम वाइल धर्मा रिजाइड धर्मा इज गिवन बाय कृष्णा बट देन इट कम्स टू इंप्लीमेंटिंग इट द वे इज नॉट जस्ट कोटिंग शास्त्र इट इज लुक एट द प्रोडिसर्स एंड लुक डीप विद इन द हार्ट कैन नॉट जस्ट ड्रॉ वन लेसन एंड दिस इज व्हाट इज टू अप्लाई एंड दिस इज व्हाट आई विल डू इवन व्हेन अर्जुन फॉर एग्जांपल इन द फर्स्ट कैंटो सेवेंथ चैप्टर व्हेन दे हैव टू डिसाइड द फेट ऑफ अश्वत्थामा इट इज ऑल ऑफ देम आर एक्चुअली इन वन सेंस दे हैव देयर शास्त्रिक रीजनिंग शुड अश्वत्थामा बी पनिश्ड शुड अश्वत्थामा बी फॉरगिवन एंड देन अर्जुन डजंट रिजॉल्व सिंपली बाय कोटिंग वन शास्त्रिक वर्ड्स दैट दैट ट्रम्प्स मे बी आई वुड यूज द वर्ड ट्रम्प दैट दैट सुपरसीड्स ऑल अदर वर्सेस he actually in one sense it draws from within his heart and krishna is pleased by that so that is also a precedent of how decisions are made krishna doesn't hand a decision to him krishna tests him and krishna trusts that he will come up with that decision exactly yeah, yeah every situation is unique every person is unique yeah. i think it's good for a devotee to understand because otherwise you compare yourself to others and think well everybody's doing this i should do it maybe that's not good for you maybe you can't do that maybe you're meant to do another service so that's also another another problem you know comparison and feeling guilty because you can't excel at one thing krishna created you with different skills and um you know krishna created living in an ashram you have limitations so what is krishna created you with different what was the word used Spin Krishna. He, we have different skills. Maybe you're skills, meant to do skills. Okay, skills. I heard skills. Skills. Maybe you're meant to do something different. Um, the you know, there's the hierarchy of service. Well, book distribution is better than deity worship, or it's better than cooking or or cleaning. But maybe you're not good at it, and and maybe it's better you clean. You're more productive, and if that's if that's a fact, then it, it's not a problem. we you accept that about yourself and it's okay mm-hmm. so it's also a matter of uh, we could say rather than thinking of inferiority or inadequacy it could be a matter of humility for a disciple to acknowledge that maybe this particular instruction which my, which i am being given i can't do this so yeah. let me see what is favorable for me so it need yeah. not be arrogance it could be one's humility also it's yeah. not arrogance or defiance to say yeah. that i cannot follow this instruction it's yeah. humility okay i'm not at that le- i'm not at that or this is not suitable for me what can yeah. i do right mm. yeah that's honest and that's you know if if it is the right decision and it is it is beneficial you know the authority will help him determine that and if that's true then that's the best decision now sometimes what we would do is we would acknowledge that someone would say yeah this is we say yeah it's true what you say but i want you to do this other service because it'll teach you self control or humility and you won't have to do it the rest of your life but just now you know so that mm-hmm. so that makes sense you know as long as the person understands okay we 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 have your back covered we know your nature we know what you want to do but this will be good for you it's always good to do something you don't like builds character you know we all all of us probably decided we had to do so many things we look back maybe we wouldn't want to do it again but we saw it was good for us that we did it when we did it because it was necessary and it was purifying mm, so we're not you, recommending Krishna? here a, like outright rebellion <laughs> against authorities at all it is just that a more nuanced balanced understanding of yeah you know, how yeah. to constructively progress in this challenging spiritual journey yeah. which is challenging not just for the subordinates to follow instructions but also for the authorities to give instructions yes. in one sense if somebody is taking that trouble to guide someone that also is compassion so we are not minimizing their role their role but it's just that it's a complex yeah. situation and we are trying to find the most uh, most constructive way ahead and and it's always good for devotees to know that the managers are under a lot of pressure to get jobs done so if you say i can't do this i don't want to do this it doesn't feel right you know then it it puts it can make their life difficult so that may be true you're not suited for that but 
you know, the right time and place and gradually working towards that, mm. um, doing the needful and so forth is important also because we have temples and projects that we have to maintain. Yeah, Giriraj Maharaj talks about this in one of his books that Prabhupada saw one of his articles in BTG and Prabhupada told him to write more. And then yes. yeah. I think uh, Sham, uh, Sham Sundar Prabhu or one of the devotees, who, they were in Mumbai and they were trying to, they were making this big Bandal festival. And uh, Sham Sundar Prabhu told him that, uh, he said, I want to write articles. Prabhupada said, you can write articles anytime. But now we have to do this Bandal festival. Now we have to approach people and get, uh, right. get funds. And now is the time we can approach anyone. So you can do it later. Then it seems that uh, he did that. And Prabhupada asked him, have you, have you been writing? He said, no. And he said, why is that? Prabhupada was disappointed. And he experienced it. Said, That's all right. And he said, Prabhupada said, there's something like, you can, you may not, you can postpone your spiritual master instruction, but you cannot reject it. And he said that I yeah, postponed oh, yeah, the instruction yeah, yeah. for about, yeah. and my guru told me to, my, my spiritual master told me to preach. I postponed it for 40 years, but I never neglected it. So yeah, yeah and look at Prabhupada. That was his life. You know, he had to postpone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good instruction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's also an example of Prabhupada understanding the nature of his disciple. Because that's one of Giriraj Swami's greatest talents is writing. Everyone appreciates his books, especially the latest book. The Jihu one. I just, I just ordered it. Everyone's saying, oh, you have to read this book. You know, and I know Giriraj Swami, and I know what a good writer he is. Yeah, he's, you know, I, I was a part of the editorial process slightly. But I realized how much years of labor and thought he has put into making this book. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, he lived through the whole scene. Yeah. <laughs> he's the right person, you know. It's true. It's true. So it's true. Okay. During the end, I tried to summarize. We had a lot of discussion, but I'll try to summarize. We, we went all over the universe. If you could summarize this, that's going to be pretty good because we, yeah. we got a little let off me, topic. Yeah, so let me try. So we try? started by discussing about what does beating the mind mean? So broadly speaking, we focus that beating the mind doesn't mean beating down our own intuitions. And that are our intuitions, Krishna's voice, are the Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, well, it doesn't have to be that Krishna will give that only to the one who is doing Priti Purvakama as Prem. Krishna can just give guidance. Krishna says, Yatha Maam Prapadin. It can be a spectrum. Just two more little steps higher in one's life. So even yes. somebody who is not a devotee may hear Krishna's voice to help them forward in their journey. What to speak of sadhakas. So then we discussed about how if following instruction means not following common sense. There are so many times when Prabhupada says, follow, use your common sense. And Prabhupada himself also recognized that, say, that I'm not your doctor to a devotee, or why are you asking me, ask an architect about this? And you are the architect. So it's not that the spirit, the guiding authority has to have an aura of infallibility or omniscience to guide. There are different areas of jurisdiction. And if somebody doesn't know, then they can always refer to someone else. And an authority doesn't know. So that that was one perspective that the author had many examples of Prabhupada exhibiting vulnerability in terms of you know okay that he said that I don't exhibit ex I don't go into ecstasy like that usually so the point is vulnerability also builds trust because otherwise if some subordinate is seeing that the disciple that the authority is giving something which is instruction which is not working properly. Then if they say, say this, is, this is what you should do, then it will simply make even a likable devotee become unlikable once they take that authority position and try to be too authoritarian. So better have a greater, so to be, so hum, vulnerability can be phrased in our traditional familiar vocabulary as humility, as saralta, simplicity, and as not, not duplicity, kutunati. So that, okay, if, there, if you have some reservations, some doubts, express them. And then learn, even in corporate circles, uh, the leaders who, uh, who are vulnerable, they often are liked the most. And uh, you talk about a, a senior leader in our moment who, who even before, before being caught, they admitted what had wrong had happened. And then the, the contemporary ethos is that rather than focusing on what was wrong done, focus on the fact that they admitted and that was appreciated. So there may be some cultural difference in India and the West. But India is also becoming westernized now. 
So in general, the power of vulnerability will be appreciated as authenticity. But then it discusses that the tradition is also if you if you can't accept one teacher's explanation, then there are other teachers whom you can go to. That we have to find out the explanation that works for us. So there are guru, there in the Pandavas had many many sages they heard from, and this is. it's not so much in defiance to our authority as more in terms of what works for us so what so we all have to make the decision for what is favorable for me and how do we decide what is favorable well if something is pandering to our lust anger greed obviously it's unfavorable but something is giving us some inspiration to serve krishna then definitely you can consider it favorable now whether that is to be acted on immediately or later like sometimes the authority will say yeah you don't want to do it life long but do it now so that you it builds your character and this is what is needed right now do the needful like prabhupad would say but overall if we focus on these two things what is favorable uh, anukulesa sankalpa and then what it gives a beneficial result falena parichayate then a lot of these decisions can be made in a way that will be constructive and uh, blaming the like giving a spiritual solution and then blaming the victim for not follow, blaming the person for not following the spiritual solution that you are traumatized chant and if your trauma is not going away that's because you are chanting purely that's actually hurting the person more so even if we say that that person is uh, not chanting purely okay but what is the solution now you can't overnight become pure so at that time some other resources if they have to be taken like reading some books or consulting some specialist help we needn't see that as outside the ambit of bhakti that is going to help us serve krishna better like you talked about in the relationships sometimes people have unresolved uh, emotional wounds from their past li- from their previous pre devotional life and then they went into enter into a close relationship like uh, marriage and all that comes out and then although chanting at the ultimate level is a solution for all problems in terms of removing an arthas at the immediate level if chanting becomes an excuse chanting more becomes an excuse for not doing uh, what it takes to for us to become a better person to learn certain skills then then we may be actually hurting our material situation maybe hurting our marriage or hurting our relationships and eventually our service by chanting more so chanting is not the problem if we are using chanting chanting is not meant to be a, a psychological tool so there's no shastrik praman that chanting will cure trauma hmm? chanting may cure the ultimate cause of the trauma that is where material existence but not <laughs> trauma itself so so that we look at common sense as something which in terms of what works for a person over here right now and okay if this is not working then try some try something which works so both from the authority's perspective that if a devotee needs something which is beyond my experience then rather than insisting this is what has worked for me this is what you should do no let's try something else that works and like we said many you mentioned that many devotees are not trained in pastoral care and that's why they may not identify psychological issues so there is a, that has to that we give room for that and then devotees they sometimes they become better you talk about some of uh, this devotee who was who was traumatized by war and your disciple also was in afghanistan so these are serious issues and even with respect to some major life decisions like whom to marry one our record has become better to the extent we have stopped being like a top down approach you know this is a person you should marry but let devotees take responsibility learn the skills learn the skills by which they can discern and also learn the skills by which they can work on the relationships so by which they can they can sustain it better and then we talked about the top down mode of instruction versus horizontal yes the bhagavatam has the, the teachers speaking to the student but then there are other references both hanta parasparam and others and in one sense there uh, there is greater engagement of the devotees because in classes one may not have to do anything so parikshit maharaj is hearing actively but not everybody in our audience may hear actively but a workshop kind where people kind of present where people have to speak they get more engaged and then they learn more from that so in that if our purpose is to remember krishna and help others remember krishna then this may be much more effective for that purpose and 
yes, different teachers can have different preferences of teaching, different preferences of how to teach. But that doesn't mean one has to be considered the sole standard traditional way and the other just some accommodation. The other might also be more effective in fulfilling the purpose of the tradition actually. And then it's like, if we start asking for uh, precedence for everything, when something is by common sense serving a powerful purpose, a valuable purpose, then it's, it could be lacking in common sense. Like Japa retreats, there may be no Prabhupada precedent, but you did give that Prabhupada said that come to India for spiritual rejuvenation. Then it's something similar, a very powerful way of a sustained interactive environment where people get realizations. And if something is drawn from within by the teacher, by the facilitator, then not only does the does the devotee feel more empowered, motivated to apply it, but also they start learning to trust that they, they themselves can they can get the insights to deal with their problems. And that is good as our movement expands because we may not have the authorities available enough to guide. So uh, also we discussed quite elaborately about this point of how the at a functional level in our movement initially, it is Prabhupada was the only guide and we asked Prabhupada about everything. But that was more functional than like an eternal thing as our movement expands. And even Prabhupada himself, you gave a different twist to this point that when Prabhupada empowered someone, a pra a Prabhupada told devotees to do extraordinary things and they did extraordinary things. One aspect of it was their faith in Prabhupada, that they were determined to follow Prabhupada's instructions and in spite of all problems. But simultaneously, it is also that Prabhupada trusted them. And then Prabhupada trusted or appreciated the ideas they came up for following them. So many of the, like the projects like Traveling Bus Party, that was not so much Prabhupada's idea as a disciple's idea, or even the um, Jagannath temp Jagannath worship. Of course, Prabhupada did it, but it started with Malti Mataji. Not that Prabhupada planned and Jagannath appeared. It was just worked out. And another thing you mentioned also was the Gurukul. A disciple came up with the idea and Prabhupada took it. So the idea is that in the West, Prabhupada left preaching to his disciples to a large extent. And he trusted them. He appreciated them when they came up with good ideas. So that I, that point of uh, trusting devotees, some usually with respect to how to implement the instruction, but also with respect to which instruction to implement, or whether a particular instruction is favorable or not, that learning to trust oneself, that being independently thoughtful, apply using our intuition, that will help devotees to that will decrease the pressure on the authorities also to always have the right answer and to be able to available for everyone, be able to available, but also to actually, uh, it will help devotees to move forward in their life, taking more responsibility. And it is not the failure of a guide if the disciple no longer needs, the student doesn't need the guide anymore. In fact, it's a success. So of course, in our tradition, the devotee will always feel grateful. So you could say spiritually dependent, but not emotionally or practically dependent so much. And then uh, we can, devotees can flourish. We all can flourish in our bhakti and our movement can also flourish. So I think there are a lot of other points also, but this is a broad summary, I think. Anything you would like to add, Prabhu? Yeah, we, you know, we were talking about beating the mind and losing confidence. And I was saying, you don't lose confidence, you just have confidence in what to beat. <laughs> you understand. <laughs> Beautiful. Not that I have all these crazy thoughts and I'm useless but no i discriminate you know. mm, powerful yeah now trust um, yourself to know what to beat and what not to beat that's what you said exactly right? that's it yeah. Yeah. and that's even from the I authorities said. point of I, view know what you know and what you don't know also yeah both ways yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 trust yourself trust your authorities uh know when not to trust yourself um and if your authority is not knowledgeable about something, that's okay. He's not perfect. And you may know more in a specific area. You can discuss that and express your needs. Is it, this should be the culture. And there's still a respect, obedience, obviously. Mm. So it's, it's, it's more natural, more real that way. Yes, true. Thank you very much. I feel this one of the very practically helpful as well as you could say broadly illuminating discussion. Very, very grateful for your time and your association, Drew. It's late night for you. Thank you for extending yourself. 
You kept me awake with this nice discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Jashri. Thank you, bro. Jashri, bro. You're welcome. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Go Premanandi. Hare Hare. Hare.